Hi all, and welcome back to Professor True Love's Concepts for Nurses series. And I am Professor Terry True Love. And in this episode of one of the respiratory concepts, we will be continuing our series of obstructive lung disease. Here we're looking at chronic obstructive lung diseases, such as pulmonary emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Sources for this episode include PE's Medical Surgical Nursing and Soul's Introduction to Critical Care Nursing. Chronic obstructive lung diseases are primarily pulmonary emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Pulmonary emphysema mostly impacts the alveoli, where chronic bronchitis mostly impacts the airways. Uh, both are characterized by bronchospasm and dyspnea. There is tissue damage that is not reversible. The tissue damage increases in severity and eventually leads to a respiratory failure and death. The definition of emphysema is a condition that traps air where air is not supposed to be. Pulmonary emphysema means, therefore, that air is trapped in areas that it's not supposed to be trapped, in this case, the alveoli. And this is caused by a loss of lung elasticity and the hyperinflation of the lung. This results in dyspnea and the need for increased respiratory rate. So the emphysema, or air trapping, is caused by a loss of elastic recoil in the alveolar walls, overstretching and enlargement of alveoli into bullae, that is, from little tiny grapes into one bigger bag, or sac, and collapse of the smallest of airways, which are the bronchioles. For most patients diagnosed with COPD, it turns out they have both pulmonary emphysema and chronic bronchitis. It is helpful for you to remember that chronic bronchitis is primarily a problem with the airways, while emphysema, that is pulmonary emphysema, is a primary problem of the alveoli. Most patients diagnosed with COPD will have both diseases, or even a little of one and more of the other. Unlike pulmonary emphysema, chronic bronchitis is an inflammation of the airways leading to those alveoli. This inflammation can affect the bronchi and the bronchioles. It's normally caused by chronic exposure to irritants, especially cigarette smoke. It is manifested by inflammation, vasodilation, congestion, mucosal edema, and bronchospasm. It affects only the airways and not the alveoli. It is also responsible for the production of large amounts of thick mucus. That is going to be important later as we discuss interventions and the patient's ability to drink fluids. Complications of COPD are primarily concerned with gas exchange issues, secondarily with cardiovascular issues and nutrition issues. So, these complications include hypoxemia and tissue anoxia, chronic acidosis, respiratory infections, that is, the potential for respiratory infections, cardiac failure, particularly core pulmonal, and cardiac dysrhythmias, normally from hypoxic injuries. When assessing the patient for COPD, make sure that you take an accurate and comprehensive history. Since tobacco use is highly linked to COPD, you should ask about a history of cigarette smoking whether it is remote, that is, they quit some time ago, or current. Other things to ask about are the effects of activity. Does your patient become dyspneic with activity? What triggers this dyspnea? Ask the patient if the dyspnea is worse when the patient is laying down. This is known as orthopnea and is a sign of COPD. Assess for and ask the patient about the presence of peripheral independent edema, which might be a sign of core pulmonal. Preserve their general appearance, not only for late signs such as a barrel chest, clubbing fingers, or cyanosis, but also for signs of malnutrition. Remember that the increased work of breathing causes an increased caloric demand, and because the patient is short of breath, they may not be able to intake as many calories as they need to keep up with the increased oxygen demand. Laboratory assessments should include arterial blood gas values, looking for abnormal oxygenation, abnormal ventilation, 
in abnormal acid base status. And remember, abnormal ventilation refers directly to carbon dioxide levels. Obtain and assess sputum samples for signs of infection, including CBC, hemoglobin and hematocrit, serum electrolytes, serum AAT, a chest x-ray to look at the size and the shape of the chest, but particularly the lungs, and a pulmonary function test, because similar to asthma, the patient will not be able to move air in and out of the lungs at the same speed because of the narrowed airways, and the volumes will have altered from normal because of the changes of the lungs themselves. Interventions, again, concentrate on proper gas exchange. So you need to improve oxygenation and reduce carbon dioxide retention. Just a little caveat here for oxygen to the COPD. -er. You need to give the patient as much oxygen as they need. Remember that CO2 retainers, that is people who are hypoxic drivers, are very late into the disease process. And even then, you should still give them the amount of oxygen that they need. You simply need to monitor them. Do not put a patient who is a known CO2 retainer on high levels of oxygen and proceed to ignore him. Other things you should do for these patients include prevent weight loss by supplying high caloric, small quantity food, minimize anxiety as a way to reduce O2 consumption, improve activity tolerance by providing for limited but scaled exercising, and prevent respiratory infection, not only by lifestyle changes, but by advising the patient to keep clear of places where they might acquire a respiratory infection. As for drug therapy, drug therapy is similar to that of asthma, and they include beta adrenergic agents, cholinergic antagonists, methylxanthines, corticosteroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and mucolytics when the mucus is absolutely too thick. However, remember that the best intervention for thick mucus is hydration. If the patient can tolerate it, that is, if they don't show signs of heart failure, encourage the patient to drink plenty of water to loosen those thickened secretions. Thinking about surgical interventions, the scarcity of donor lungs really eliminates the possibility that a COPD -er will be receiving one of those lungs. However, lung reduction surgery, in which the hyperinflated areas of the lung are removed, actually shows quite a bit of improvement for the quality of life of these patients. However, preoperative care and testing must be done to make sure that the patient doesn't have cardiac problems or renal problems related to the COPD that may cause them complications. Currently, it is preferred to do a minimally invasive surgical technique using video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, or VATS. However, open procedures are still done if necessary. Your post-operative care is going to be dependent on the type of surgery. The more invasive, the longer the recovery period. However, coughing, deep breathing, and avoiding infection are all priorities after these types of surgeries. You need to maintain and keep proper pulmonary hygiene. The fact that COPD will never get fixed is going to dictate the community-based care. In home care, management has to revolve around the long-term use of oxygen and a pulmonary rehabilitation program, which includes things like dyspnea management. This is because this dyspnea can interfere with things like eating. So teach the patient to pace themselves while they're eating. While we're talking about breathing patterns, you'll want to teach the patient about pursed lip breathing, which is when they inhale through their nose and exhale through their mouth as if they're whistling. This will cause a little back pressure, sort of like pee, and allow some of the trapped air to escape. Think about techniques like diaphragmatic breathing, in which you encourage the patient to visualize and hold on to their diaphragm in an effort to reduce the use of accessory muscles. Remember, accessory muscles aren't made for breathing and they burn more calories when they're trying to respirate. Teaching the patient to exercise and use their diaphragm is an ideal way to reduce oxygen consumption. Also teach the patient about ways to combat orthopnea. Teach them about sitting up in a tripod position or leaning forward. Lastly, you want to teach them about proper coughing techniques. The patient should have what's called a controlled cough 
taking a deep breath in and having two or three mini coughs, that is small coughs, where they don't get into this jagged, ragged coughing spell that causes them a lot of oxygen consumption and makes them feel dyspnea. Remind the patient on proper techniques for using medications, what manifestations of infections look like so they know how to report it, and lastly, how to relax in the time of crisis. Relaxation during exacerbation is an excellent way to conserve oxygen. That is the end of this episode. However, there are still more respiratory episodes to come. So as always, I hope you learned a little bit. I hope you plan on coming back and listening some more. And if you are, we'll see you then. Take care, guys.